with everybody. We'll go ahead and get started uh, right here. I think we've got a couple others that I know are going to be joining with us as we uh, uh, finish Daniel Part 1, the last lesson, Lesson 8, uh, covering the first six chapters of Daniel. And so uh, let's pray together and we'll look at the, uh, uh, the sixth chapter and perhaps even the totality of everything we've looked at right here. And so, Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I thank you for what we have learned this week and this particular portion of the scripture. Uh, Lord, you placed it there for such a time as this, and you place it there for each one of us, and I give you thanks for that. And Lord, I pray that you continue to give us understanding, that you continue to give us your revelation and your insight. Uh, Lord, I pray particularly for Eliza. I just saw a while ago where she's sick, and I just ask that you would just touch her and that you would heal her. Lord, as well as the uh, the many in each one of our lives that are uh, undergoing either just uh, seasonal sicknesses, other various diseases and afflictions. Um, Lord, I praise you for how you have touched so many here locally. Uh, Lord, the, the, the many things I can sit here and recount that you have done, we just give you thanks. We give you praise for it. So, Lord, you just continue to teach us. And you give us uh, uh, your understanding, your mind, what it is that you want us to know. And we thank you. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's, it's good to see everybody uh, this evening. Uh, as we begin, uh, as I often do, I just like to ask uh, sort of what it was that struck you out of your studies this week. What really impacted you? What was it that uh, that you saw perhaps for the first time? Uh, perhaps not, but there was something that just really, really spoke to you this time. So was there anything like that that any of you would like to share? Um, yeah, I'll start. The, the thing that just blew me away was um, the last page where it says in number eight, know that he's pleased even if others think you're a fool. That really spoke to me and it's um, very applicable for what's happening in my life right now and that was really awesome. Really? Why, why did that speak to you without getting into you know, details or anything? Well, people just don't understand um, your lifestyle choices or, you know, especially when you're a Christian and the decisions you make, non-Christians just have no idea or just can't comprehend it and they just think you're an idiot or that you're um, not doing your life the way they would do it. Um, so that was really great encouragement to me that, um, you know, you're looking for him and his pleasure and, and how he wants you to order your life, not others. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. Anyone else? That's probably a real good way to approach the, uh, all the stuff we looked at here was uh, how you order your life. Is that the way you said it, Rachel? Yeah, I was just going to add, and in relation to Daniel, um, people would have thought that he was foolish to still openly pray when, you know, he could have just um, kept cool for 30 days and then went back to praying. Um, you know, people would have thought it's not a big deal, but to Daniel it was a big deal. So what were the options that were left open to him? You just said just then, not prayed for 30 days. Well, he could have just done it in his head. He could have just prayed in his head. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So why didn't he? Well, I guess it would be looking like he's um, bending his um, standards or um, changing what he always does to suit their um, decree. Yeah, but what harm would that have done? Yes, well, these days I'd think, yeah, what harm would it do? <laughs> <laughs> That's what a lot of people would say, right? Yeah, who was Aaron wrote down compromise. A compromise in what way? No, oh, okay, of his faith. So did God require him to uh, pray three times a day like that and to face Jerusalem and to do it with the window open? No, no. So how would it have been a compromise? 
that's something he he set aside. That was what he was felt that God had asked him to do. And if that's what he felt like God asked him to do, then that was a command on his life from God. And if he was to give in in any way in that uh, arena, then he would sort of be compromising what God had asked or he felt that God had asked him to do. And uh, so even though it wasn't written, it was still a standard that he felt called to in his life. Okay. So let's back up a little bit. Tell me what precipitated this whole uh, situation, this whole decision on his part. What brought it to this point? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Make sure you check the chat. That's good, Rachel. Good, Aaron. So what placed Daniel in this situation? Those that were around him were jealous. Yeah. What were they jealous of? Very good. Yeah. Um, how he had uh, risen in authority and uh, position within the um I guess the, the role that they played within the community. They they wanted that position, and they were jealous of Daniel. I guess being Hebrew, he moved up the ranks like you know with a with a ease. You know he just he was. I guess the um it appears that the king um had a uh, favor on him that he liked him, and I guess they didn't like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, what do you mean Darius, not Cyrus? Oh, <laughs> Aaron's making a comment about the uh, the Bible series on the History Channel. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by that? So just work with me here, favorite son. They had uh, they portrayed uh, Daniel being thrown in the lion's den by Cyrus at the time of Cyrus, which is not true. It's false. It was Darius. I just found that it was kind of funny that they would totally. Uh, tell the story wrong. Uh, so why do you think it was wrong? Obviously, they didn't heed what the word was saying. What does the word say? Darius. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of an interesting thing because there's actually debate over who the king was. Uh, if I've got this right, uh, Darius was Cyrus's father-in-law. There was a relationship through marriage there. And Cyrus was actually the one that was over the uh, army and uh, was actually in charge of the army. There was another guy that led uh, the actual infiltration into the city. Uh, but Cyrus was the one that was leading the army that night. So Cyrus actually conquered the city. And uh, But Darius was the king at that time. And according to what we know, supposedly through history, he only reigned a couple of years as king and so this would have been uh within a couple of years after the conquering of the city that we saw last week and so darius was the king proper cyrus became king later uh but there are uh, there is some debate about that out in the uh, uh, jewish scholarly lands and the such so that's probably where they got that storyline from uh within the scripture there uh, aaron the, the deviation from what we have within the Word. Uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible program out there that that I've seen so far. I didn't see last Sunday night yet, so God don't spoil it for me yet. Okay, but uh, there's uh, there's things that are like Jewish traditions. There are things that are that man's not quite sure about, so they went this way rather than that way, and so you run into that in any type of interpretation like that. But anyway, yeah, the scripture that we have right here says it was Darius uh, that came along. And uh, what did Darius do? He comes along. He's a king at this time. And so, uh, as uh, Sharice said, he um, some of the people didn't like Daniel. And it's for this reason uh, the governmental structure was being set up. And that's one reason to think that it was at the very beginning or close to the beginning of his reign because they were still establishing ruling over the Babylonian land. And so Darius set up over the kingdom 120 uh, leaders, <clears throat> satraps. And uh, over those satraps, 
he set three people that are called governors in some translation. Uh, one translation actually says presidents. And so there were people that would govern over those satraps. Daniel was one of those governors. Uh, oh, does the ESV say that, Aaron? Does it call him president? Okay, great, great. Uh, so you had these three guys that were over these satraps, and they were put in charge of uh, the king's stuff, the king's money. How did Daniel wind up in that position? Yeah, I think that's probably it, Aaron. It's, a, a, it's just his excellent spirit. The, the bulk of what we did this week in your homework, in your examination, was to, uh, of his uh, Daniel's integrity, okay, the spirit that was within him and how he was described. It gets even more interesting. Do you remember what happened to Daniel right before, uh, when uh, the end of the fifth chapter, when uh, Babylon fell, when the head of gold fell to the Medo-Persian Empire? What was Daniel's status? When that kingdom, when the Babylonian kingdom collapsed, Daniel's status was what? Close. Yeah, he'd been made third in the kingdom. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, and he was old. He was. There's debate over it, but he was in his 80s. Some people say 80, some say 85. Uh, uh, one person I really trust is 88, so it really doesn't matter, but he was in his 80s. And he was a, a third in the kingdom because remember what Belshazzar said, if you're uh, able to tell me what this handwriting on the wall means, I'll make you third in the kingdom. Daniel said you can keep your keep all that kind of stuff. But even after it was done, he was made third in the kingdom. And I find this intriguing because when the Medo-Persians came in and they conquered that very night, they crucified 3,000 leaders of the Babylonians. We don't know this from scripture. We know this from history. They crucified 3,000 leaders. I suspect a 1,000 of them came from that big party that was being had. Remember how Belshazzar had called in a 1,000 of his nobles? So how do you think it is that Daniel, who was actually acknowledged as third in the kingdom, avoided being one of those that was crucified? What's your question mark about, Aaron? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, maybe they just, you know, seeing the spirit within Daniel. I mean, he he found he had favor with everybody else, so it's, I guess maybe they could have seen found favor with, you know, Darius yeah. and his then coming in there. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Uh, well, yeah, Donna, I think the, uh, the word doesn't tell us to start with, and I think God preserved him. Yeah, Rachel, I think God delivered him. I think God protected him, and God watched over him. God had a purpose for him. Uh, could it have been that the, uh, the Medes and the Persians had heard about Daniel? <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Uh, they could have absolutely. Could it be simply that he was, he went back to wherever he was, and they thought it was just, oh, man. Yeah, there's any number of what we would call, quote, unquote, logical reasons. But the bottom line is the Lord preserved him uh, to such a degree that the king heard about him, found out about him, who he was, whatever it was, he winds up being one of the top three guys over these satraps right here. And so what was the response of the uh, uh, the other satraps uh, to this situation, to Daniel being there? No, they didn't like it at all. What was it that they, that they didn't like about him? Uh, Aaron says that he had no error or no fault. So is that the reason they didn't like him? Yeah, what were they jealous of, Donna? All right, keep digging it out. <laughs> yeah, look what it says in verse 3 of the 6th chapter. Uh, it says, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. The next word, so, so, so what? So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They sought to find a charge against him because the king was considering to do what? 
and put him in charge of the whole realm over the whole kingdom because of the excellent spirit that was within him. Yeah, you see the same thing repeated throughout. You see this excellent spirit. Yes, Rachel, you going to say something? I thought I heard somebody, but I didn't see who it was. So when they saw that the king was considering putting him over everything, which would have been over them also, okay, uh, they sought to do what? To find something wrong with him, to bring a charge, to bring a fault. But they couldn't find a fault, and they couldn't find a charge. Why was that? Well, the word says that he was um, he was that he was faithful, no nothing. Yeah, Sharice, we heard the first part, then lost you. That he was faithful in what? Donna says he was honest. Yeah. And scripture says that he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. He was faithful to what? Yeah. Yeah, Rachel, I think so too. Yeah, he was, uh, Aaron just put the text, that he was faithful to the king. You know, immediately we won't go, well, he was faithful to God. Well, he was faithful to God, but he was faithful to the king. He wasn't corrupt. And because of the fact that he was honest and he wasn't corrupt and he didn't make any errors, you know, I don't know how it is in New Zealand, but we have rounding errors at the federal level in our nation, Rachel, that amount to the trillions, you know, and it's just corruption. It's all it is. And he wasn't corrupt in any way. And so what's going to happen if everybody else is corrupt and you're the one that's not corrupt? How are they going to react to you? Yeah, I think that's what's going on here. Yeah, you like a rounded error like that. <laughs> so they finally reached conclusion. And apparently, you know, they had looked for ways to, uh, to bring accusation against him for his job and what he'd done on his job in relationship to the king and just think about that you know um, can we actually say that no one would find any source of accusation against us when it came to a job or came to what we would say about somebody else anything like that yeah donna you make it look bad absolutely yeah so sometimes we just say the little simple thing that can be twisted into uh, some accusation they couldn't even find anything like that and so they finally came back, and what was the strategy that they settled upon to try to trip him up? Well, yeah. Well, it was a twofold thing, exactly. Y'all got it there. But they were going to go, and Aaron, I'm not sure I want to say attack his faith. I know what you mean by that, okay? But were they actually attacking the faith? Or what? Or his allegiance to his God in comparison with the allegiance to the king. Yeah. They, they realized that the way they were going to get him was concerning the law in relationship to his God. Okay? And see if they could set something up like that. So tell me what do these governors and these satraps do? They come before the king and say what? <laughs> they always start with this. Same thing. Oh, king, live forever. Yeah. And then they did what? Yeah. Well, they had a little plan here. Yeah, they said, hey, king, how about you doing this? Uh, they say this in verse 7. Oh, king Darius, live forever. All of the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and the, and the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree. <laughs> to start with, was that true? No, it wasn't true. What was, what was untrue about it? Daniel wasn't consulted or part of the big conversation. Yeah, no doubt. And so when they said all oh, the governors have done this, well, uh, except for that one that you're wanting to make the boss over all of us, they sort of left that little detail out. So 
So they said, we, we want you to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, will be cast into the den of lions. Well, we already know what their motivation is. But why did they bring this type of strategy before the king? Uh, might it appeal to the king's pride? Do kings have pride? I think anybody in power has um, the ability to become prideful. Yeah, yeah. And it's not only those that are in power. Uh, I mean, sometimes pride manifests itself in, uh, in ways that we really don't think is pride. Um, I, I deal with that uh, really quite a bit with folks. I've had a situation here of late with a piano student like that who just would refuse to try to do a particular thing that I'd ask them to do. And it's the kind of thing, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. Oh, and they're scared, and they're literally paralyzed. I mean, literally paralyzed from it. I think we had a breakthrough today related to it, so I'm, I'm just thinking of that right now. And the reason, and I finally told them the reason they were paralyzed, they thought it was fear, they thought it was all this. I said, no, it's pride. I said, it's pride because you're scared that you're going to fail. You're scared that you're going to mess up. You're scared that something's going to happen that you can't control and you want to be in control. And we don't think of it uh, quite like that, but it's the same thing. Okay? It's the same exact thing. And so they did. They were coming to speak to the pride of this king, and they actually pushed him on it. They said, oh, king, establish this decree and sign it in writing. When they signed it in writing, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, um, it couldn't be altered. Even the king himself could not alter it. And it seems so innocent, and it seems so appropriate at the beginning of a kingdom like this, when you're trying to establish everything that you're telling everybody, okay, we want everybody to bow before the king. We want everybody to worship the king. We want everybody to do what the king does right here. And then after this, we don't care which God you go after, but you're just going to acknowledge who is king right here. And so uh, he signed it. Was it a wise thing for him to sign it? You know, generally speaking, uh, I said, was it a wise thing for him to sign it? And everybody's saying no. But generally speaking, any time that you try to restrict uh, somebody else in the name of doing something that you think is right for them, that's not the best way to go about doing it. You know, it really isn't. So Daniel hears about this, tells us in the what verse, was it, ninth verse. He knew the, that it was signed. When he knew about it, he went home to do what? Yeah, great. Go about doing what he had been doing. Well, I thought that we had to be obedient to the decrees of the uh, the governments over us. Unless it goes against God. Was this going against God? How was it going against God? We talked a little bit about it already. Let me just think about it some more. Yes, wasn't it going against God? Because the decree said um, that they were not allowed to make a petition to any God or man besides the king. And we are obligated to go to God. So that would be going against God, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. A really good point. And it's not so much the fact that he did it three times a day. It's the fact that he did it, period. Okay, that he did it, period. At that time, Karen's down here at the chat, and Karen, we greatly miss your voice this evening. She says, well, there's a place for, quote, unquote, civil disobedience. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And, but even that term, civil disobedience, uh, sort of paints the picture in the negative when it really doesn't need to be. It's not civil disobedience as it is standing for what's right and doing what's right. You know what I mean, Karen? Does that, does that make sense? Oh, she agrees. Okay. Um, you know, he knew that he was going to pray, and he had determined <laughs> – yeah, we're using the terms. Uh, he determined to carry about doing what he had been doing, 
Now, Daniel is no fool. He very well may have known what was going on. Uh, Rachel, you brought up earlier at, at the beginning that he could have uh, he could have shut the windows and nobody would have ever known. Absolutely true. He could have sat there and prayed, prayed in his closet. Okay, we see that later on in the scripture. You know, to go into a quiet place. He could have done that. But you know, I really think that he did what the Lord led him to do, and the Lord led him to pray in this way. And he knew they were watching. And he went ahead and did it anyway. Okay, he went ahead and defied. I mean, literally defied the decree. Well, these folks were just chomping at the bits, and so they come back to the king. And what do they say to the king? I think it's sort of interesting how uh, nearly belligerent they were. You know, it said, so, okay, didn't you sign a decree? Well, yeah, they knew it. I mean, it looked like they came back the next day, you know, the way they came. That anybody who does this and doesn't, you know, doesn't worship you for 30 days is going to get thrown in the den of lions. And the king said, yeah, the thing's true. According to the law of Medes and Persians, which does not alter. This is actually where we get to... Uh, 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 that phrase that you see in the Ten Commandments, moving the Yule Brenner line, so let it be written, so let it be done, that kind of line. That's exactly where it comes from, but it's coming from this story right here. And so as soon as he acknowledges that, what do they say? Yeah, look at verse, uh, where is it, verse 13. <laughs> when the king acknowledges that, they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, it wasn't even Daniel, you know, like one of our co-workers, Daniel, one of the three of us, because we're really not sure even all the way through the story who it was that was coming before. We know it was the governors and the satraps, but we don't know how many of which ones. But they describe him as that Daniel. That Daniel. And what does that communicate? What does that express? Yeah, dislike, disdain. Yeah, Rachel, they pull up the Jew thing in the next phrase. That Daniel, who's one of the captives from Judah. Okay, yeah. And so a lot of people, boy, when we read the commentaries about it, a lot of people pick up on this and say, this is one of the first anti-Semitic statements. <laughs> I don't think I'd put it quite like that. But, yeah, that, that Daniel, I tell you what, you can see it today. Just just jump around on the news today. Just jump around on the news today. One of the uh, – probably the most liberal uh, cable news network here in the States uh, had something going on in the morning show this morning, and there was a lady that was speaking of uh, – uh, 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 in utero babies, fetuses, and she had a model of a uh, at the very beginning of conception and what happens, and she kept referring to it as this thing, this thing, and how this thing right here, if this thing is allowed to become a, a, a baby and to be born, this thing is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it was just one of the most uh, abhorrent uh, things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it was crazy. Uh, and it's the same thing right here. They come to him, that Daniel. Well, the king knew what was going on by then. Okay? The king knew. Because that Daniel, described that way, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show a due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you've signed, because he keeps making petitions three times a day to that God of his. The king was greatly, greatly displeased. Why do you think he was displeased? Yeah, right. So I think that's a big thing. He knew he'd been had. He knew he'd been tricked. What else? Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. He 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 liked Daniel. Okay. He he liked Daniel. He was going to make, put him in charge of everything. Do you remember how he was described? Okay, we looked at some. I mean, you, you see so many attributes about Daniel in the sixth chapter. You saw that he was distinguished above those other guys. He had an extraordinary spirit. 
He couldn't find any cause for accusation against him in any way. He was faithful in everything. There was no corruption in him. Uh, he literally held to the law of God. Uh, he prayed, even in this situation right here. He prayed without ceasing. Who wouldn't want somebody like this? And so he would do exactly what the king wanted. Yeah, very good. And so the king set about to do what? Try to find a way to um, rescue them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Try to find a way to rescue them. Yeah, Rachel will fix it. Oh, yeah, Karen, don't you know that hated him is a goody two shoes kind of thing? Yeah, that's the way the world thinks about it and such. And so the king spent the balance of the day trying to figure out some way to go about this to where he could rescue him. But when the sun started going down, why is it important that when the sun's going down, that these men came to the king and said, Oh, king. According to the law of Medes and Persians, that no decree of statute which king establishes may be changed. Apparently, the idea behind this is, uh, yeah, it's time for the lions to eat. The idea behind it is that when this was declared, if someone's found to be in violation of it, they were to be executed that day. And so it would be before the sun went down. He had that time to expedite the execution. He had no doubt, Karen, darkness on the horizon. And so the king could find no way uh, to do it. So he did what? He called, gave the command, and brought Daniel and cast him in the lion's den. But before he cast him in the lion's den, what did the king say to Daniel? Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Is that not one of the greatest affirmations of faith? I mean, the king is sitting there looking at him and said, I'm the one that's got you in this situation. And I can't get you out of it. I mean, I, to me, I think it's just very, very encouraging because I would dare say that each and every one of us have done things and got ourselves and other people in the situations and there's no way out of it. And if it wasn't by, except for the grace and the mercy of the Most High God. And so the king acknowledges that. He says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And so they threw him in the lion's den. They brought a stone and covered it over the mouth of that den and then did what with the stone? Yeah, they sealed it all the way around. Yeah, and the things you are, the chat thinks you're absolutely right. He really is such an example, Rachel. It's such a testimony. Uh, does this sound like anything else that you encounter somewhere in the scripture? Perhaps something that you might be paying a little more attention to even this week? A tomb of what? A tomb of Christ? It sounds very much like the same thing. The Lord was dead. They took him in on the cross. They, what do you do with a dead body? You lay him in the tomb. There's no hope. They put a seal around it because the Jews remember that Jesus said on the third day that he would rise again. They had a Roman seal. Here they have a Medo-Persian seal. The king uses his own signet ring and the rings of his lords to seal this thing. Why would they seal uh, the stone? Why would they do that? Yeah, nobody could get in. More importantly, what else? Nobody could get out? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. But the idea being, yeah, that's it, Rachel, to know if someone has opened this thing. To know if someone has been inside it. And so they threw Daniel in there. And the king went where? Yeah, he went to his palace and he spent the night fasting. 
Why was he fasting? Fasting for Daniel. But uh, how can I say this? Uh, usually when you're fasting, you're fasting to the purpose of what? Rachel says he's so upset he couldn't eat. Usually you're, yeah, I can answer prayer, but who would he be praying to? Would he be praying and fasting to the God that he just acknowledged a while ago, the God that Daniel served? It doesn't really tell us. He just says that he didn't eat that night. Okay, He didn't bring any musicians in. He didn't bring any entertainment in. He didn't bring the dancing girls in like kings would do. And he didn't do any of that stuff. And he didn't sleep that night. But he arose very early in the morning. Why would he have risen in the early, early in the morning and at that time? Yeah, Rachel, I think you're probably right. What's finished, Aaron? Daniel's time? Yeah. So the king gets up and he goes where? Yeah, to the den. Kings don't do that. The king doesn't have to get up and go anywhere. So the king can just summon information and it will be brought to him. Yeah, I think that's it, Aaron. He, he was really, really concerned and really cared. And he gets up at the, day, the break of dawn because every breaking dawn is a new way. A new day, a new opportunity. Yeah. He gets up, he goes at the time when the judgment has ended. And before he even gets to the den, he's doing what? Yeah, that's exactly it, Karen. His mercies are new every morning. He's crying out. He's crying out to Daniel before he even gets there. And what does he declare? Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually, being able to deliver you from the lions. You know, quite similar to what we see in the New Testament. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He declared to Daniel, your God can do this. Now he comes back the next day. Has your God done this? And then Daniel says, O king, live forever. That just sounds different to me than the previous O king, live forever that we heard. What about y'all? Yeah, he says, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. And he tells him why. Because I was found innocent before him. And, uh, oh, yeah, O king. I also have done no wrong before you. <laughs> oh, so what was the response of the king to this? Oh, yeah, the king was ecstatic. Uh, the new King James says he was exceedingly glad for him. Exceedingly. And he commanded that he should be, uh, that Daniel should be brought out, taken out of the den. Could he do that now? Yeah, the judgment had been executed. The judgment was over, you know, so he could be set free. So he's taken out the, what the injury found him because he believed in his God. Now, let me read this again. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. Why did this happen? Because he believed in his God. That is really cool, is it not, Rachel? <laughs> so, what did the king do next? Yeah, he brought forth another decree. Feed the lions some slave traps. He brought the men who had accused Daniel. <laughs> and they cast him in the den of lions. Uh, Josephus writes some interesting things related to this, the first century Jewish historian, uh, of what happened in this account right here, uh, that these uh, men that had accused Daniel were actually saying that the reason that Daniel had not been eaten 
they were accusing the king was because the lions had been heavily fed before they threw Daniel in there. That was part of what the king was trying to do, that he fed the lions and that he heavily fed them. And that's the reason that uh, Daniel was not eaten. And Josephus says that the king was so infuriated by this that he comes back and he feeds the lions. Okay? He feeds the lions their regular food. And then he throws the people in. And the lions overpowered them before they even hit the bottom of the den. Yeah, yeah, you want proof? Here, let me feed the lions right now. And to prove that this is really God, Daniel's God that did this, I'm going to throw you in there. And uh, if they're full, like you said they were, and that's the reason Daniel's alive, then they won't bother you either. And so he throws them, their wives, and their children. Rachel, what Rachel says something here. Uh, Rachel, why do you think that's sad? Are children innocent? Rachel takes me yeah, innocent. No, we're all born in sin. That's true. Yeah. But Rachel says, yes. It It does break your heart. And it wasn't their sin, but uh, we're also not functioning under the uh, uh, the law of the Most High God right here. The law of the Most High God and the law of Moses right there said that a, a child would not be held for account of the sin that his father had done, right? But according to the Medo-Persian law, the understanding was, hey, if uh, if the father did it, then everybody in the family must have known. And it is. I mean, it's just hard. It's actually hard to accept and even think about those things and the fact that it, it wasn't their sin, and yet they wound up being judged because of it. So uh, I think it says the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Very, very uh, uh, clear and concise what happened right here. So. King Darius did issue a new decree. And what did that new decree say? It actually seen as a decree somewhat like this. Yeah, basically it says, Fear of God, the God of Daniel. This is quite similar to the type of thing that uh, <clears throat> we saw with King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that? When all the stuff had been said at the end of the day, when, his, when he came back to his right mind. So King Darius wrote this thing to all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. <laughs> That's a rather big picture thing. Peace be multiplied to you. And he says, I make this decree to everybody. Everybody in the dominion of my kingdom that you tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. And what do you find out about the God of Daniel? He's a living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one that sh which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who has worked Daniel and has delivered him from the power of the lions. You know, I, I just went through my mind, that would be a really good study there, uh, to go and to look at all these uh, decrees like this, and these praises, these declarations that tell us so much about God, but that were spoken through pagan kings and pagan leaders. Uh, I think at this time that Darius was actually a believer. You know, we'll find out when we get the glory. So what happened? Yeah, Aaron, you just said it. Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel prospered. Now, very quickly, just in the uh, balance of our time together, you look up uh, uh, several scripture passages related to uh, basically integrity, looking at people in the Old Testament especially. Uh, just give me some basic things that you learned about that. Uh, 
Uh, tell me how Job was described. Do you remember that? Blameless, upright, fearing God, turns away from evil. Yeah, yeah. And there's no one like him on earth. Exactly. And yet he had horrible things come against him, right? Uh, there's some, uh, at the end of Job, there were a couple of interesting things that were talking about that. Remember how he made a covenant with his eyes? He said that he'd made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look upon the uh, uh, the maidens, I think is how it's explained. And also the end of Job talked about how uh, there's things that will keep that will trip you up from walking in integrity. And he said, don't do these things. Don't mistreat slaves or, or employees and uh, provide for those that need food. Or food. Uh, don't trust in riches. Uh, don't be enticed to go into pagan worship, false worship, you know, worship of the guys in the moon. Uh, don't rejoice in the enemy's destruction. Okay. And don't hide a transgression. And so there were just several things that we saw in relation in uh, relationship to integrity. Uh, let me see, Karen. Yeah, Karen says it's interesting how sin affects us even when it's not our own. Yes, it really is. Why do you uh, give me an example of what you mean by interesting? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think it's uh, I think it is because uh, I think the enemy has strategies for us as people, as individuals, and as families. And that's the reason you'll see the same type of sin going through a family from generation to generation to generation. Mm-hmm. You know, overall, in the, the first six chapters of Daniel, we've seen him... Uh, functioning with integrity, I mean, beyond anything that, I mean, you consider what happened to him, that he was taken away from his home, the things they probably did to him physically, the things that happened to him. In the first chapter, you saw how he uh, uh, did not defile himself with the king's food, that he was uh, wise, we would say, beyond his years, that he was respectful of the king. In the second chapter, even though God enabled him to interpret these dreams, these visions, that he walked in humility, uh, in the fourth chapter, uh, that you see him being real respectful of the king, but he didn't fear him. And then in the fifth chapter, you know, he just he's older. He just confronts the king with the sin, turns down all the riches and everything. So what did Rachel say here? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel has 12 chapters. The first six chapters cover what? Do y'all remember that from our first lesson together? What does the first six chapters cover? Yeah, you're going to love this. It's basically the story of, of Daniel's life. Yeah, it's the history. It's the chron- chronology and the history of Daniel. And and the things that occurred, and because uh, you see it going up to him reigning and and uh, uh, are prospering to the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Uh, what are chapters seven through twelve about? Oh, okay, Aaron says prophetic prophetic word. Yeah, yeah, it shows God as being the most high over all the pagan domains. And then what we'll study next, well, this is the end of part one, when we pick up part two, what you'll see is these dreams that in Daniel had. In chapter one through six, Daniel's interpreting the dreams by God of the kings. Seven through 12, we're going to see the dreams that Daniel had in his life. And so that's the reason you'll pick up chapter seven. It'll say in the year of a certain king, Belshazzar. Well, at the end of chapter six, he's been dead for a while. So Daniel is going back and he's, putting these visions that he had he's actually telling us in what time frame he had those visions and so we go from daniel interpreting dreams to now daniel talk about the dreams and visions he had and angels interpreting 
Okay, good. Uh, Rachel wants to know, is uh, next week the same password to enter the room? Uh, no, it is not the same password. Uh, and I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but I'll send you an email to let you know what it is, okay? I could probably look it up right now, but I'll try to be careful on my computer lest I crash the session. But I'll send it to you, okay? Good. Anybody have anything you'd like to share here? Anything you'd like to say? Daniel is a very, very good book to uh, have uh, at your disposal uh, today. Uh, more and more people want to know about it. Uh, and when you sit there and they ask you about what's happening in the Middle East and all this kind of stuff, as we'll see in the next few weeks, uh, this is really, really important for us to have. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way, Karen. But, yeah, we're at the end of how they divide it now. Yeah, I think Karen wants to know if next week's is an orientation. I believe I set up next week's as an orientation. And because we've got several, I know we've got three or four new folks that will be joining next week uh, with us. So we'll do the orientation next week, make sure things started. Yeah, this one will be the same time. Yeah, this is the end of part one, Sharice. I'm the same way. Uh, uh, I think a lot of us were working out of the old books <laughs> that we had. And so now we'll pick up chapter seven in a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, good. Rachel, would you mind praying for us? Sure. Father God, we thank you so much that we can read your word. And we thank you for the time that Dale has put into leading us and um, we just pray a special blessing on him and his family. And we just pray that you help us to gain more insights as we move on and that uh, you reveal more things to us. And Father, we just pray that whatever we learn, we put into practice. And Father, we just want to make you as the most high God in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Walk in the integrity of the Most High. And I'll see you next week.